We'll just start the meeting if everyone gets with us. Uh, I'm John Clarkson, the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association president. Welcome to our September 17th uh, general membership meeting. A couple of announcements and notes. Uh, tonight, our, our, we have two guest speakers, uh, hopefully, including first Jordan Carlio Evangelist, who is SUNY Albany's Director of Community Relations. And he is going to be talking about uh, SUNY Albany reopening, including, of course, the COVID spoke, spike that is currently taking place, the precautions that the universe has and is taking, and uh, what the situation generally is. We also hope to have the mayor's chief of staff, David Gallen, with us, and he will be talking about the census and how that's going. Then we'll have our, usually commit, our usual committee officer and other reports, and we will have uh, perhaps one or more elected officials who represent us in the Common Council in the Albany County Legislature, and we'll have them speaking as well. So I will make my updates very brief. Uh, our fall meetings are starting. This is the first one. We will have a meeting at 7 p.m. every third Thursday of the month, including October, November, and uh, December. And uh, we don't know what, what we will be doing in the first part of 2021, but we assume we'll still be online. And we are trying to do that as well and as seamlessly as we can and make sure you can watch it either live on Facebook or through other means. And we also are going to make the videos available afterward on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, we are looking at new modes of communication uh, just to keep up generally with technology and with social media, but also because of the uh, pandemic and because we need some upgrades. We're hoping to upgrade our website. Currently, it's very, fairly difficult for us to update that. And so we share a lot of stuff through our Google group if you are a member, but ultimately we will be able to share our notes and other things in real time the website and perhaps also post videos there. Uh, in addition to what we do during our general monthly membership meetings, we do a lot of things in between. The Pine Hills Neighborhood Association Board often discusses issues and meets via email. And uh, since the uh, pandemic, of course, we have had uh, semi-regular Zoom board meetings. And it occurred to us that we were not putting out notes from those meetings. So we have uh, addressed that and on the Google group, which members belong to, uh, we put out a list of the board actions that we have taken uh, in between basically the end of June, the 23rd and uh, this meeting. And uh, I'll just, I'm not gonna go through them all, but on June 23rd, we took an email vote in uh, support of uh, the College of St. Rose's application before the Board of Zoning appeals for a sign waiver. On July 5th, we had a vote where we voted to oppose an ordinance, ordinance proposed before the Common Council, uh, Ordinance 15.81.19, uh, sponsored by Hoey, and uh, it was an ordinance that, that had some flaws, and basically the planning board's advice had been, uh, and, and offer to work with the sponsors had not been accepted. That, that bill is... Uh, that ordinance is now being discussed between the planning board and the common council. We understand a altered proposal is going to go forward eventually. We also voted on July 13th to support local law H in the county legislature and that was the sparkling devices repeal. Uh, fireworks have been a big problem in our neighborhood and all over the city and indeed the region and the country. And this is uh, one step of many that need to be taken to address that. And just on September 10th, uh, we, we finished up work on a Black Lives Matter resolution that was passed by the board unanimously. Uh, Lori, if you could put that up on the screen. We uh, posted it on our group, our, our Google group today, and we're going to be promoting it in other ways. So there's a resolution, I will read it. Black Lives Matter. On behalf of the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association, we stand with the Black Lives Matter movement and its fight for justice and equality for all. We stand against racism and the mistreatment of people of color everywhere. We acknowledge that people of color in this country 
and in our own community have been mistreated, oppressed, abused, and underserved, it is beyond time to implement permanent change in policies, laws, the justice system, and the conditions in which people live and work. We understand that this is a traumatizing and emotion evoking time for communities. We believe that neighborhoods can solve issues, promote healing, and become stronger when we stand together. In our efforts to improve the Pine Hills neighborhood, we have zero tolerance for racism or any other form of discrimination. Please join us in a firm stance against the legacy of discrimination and racial injustice to envision a kinder world where neighbors can rely on each other and where all feel welcome because black lives matter. So we wanted to read that tonight. Uh, it reflected some very hard work by uh, Perry Jenjulis, a member of our board who is not able to be here. So I subbed. So you can take that down, Laura, and I think we're ready to begin with Jordan Carlo Evangelist and the discussion on SUNY Albany reopening. Thanks, John. I'm going to uh, just quickly share my screen here. Can everybody see that okay? Someone give me a thumbs up. All right, great. Um, so yes, thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Jordan Carlio Evangelist. I am uh, Director of Community Relations at UAlbany. And I just want to acknowledge just real quickly that also here is Luke Rumsey, a familiar face I know for all of you. He is our Assistant Dean of Students, specializing in off-campus student services. And uh, we also have uh, Kevin Wilcox, a proud Albanian and also our Associate Vice President for Enterprise Risk Management and Compliance. Uh, we call him Captain COVID because since February, I think, Kevin has been uh, deeply involved in all things related to COVID-19 on our campus, uh, starting with when we had to bring our uh, international students abroad home. So uh, Kevin is as close to a campus expert as we have. So um, thank you for having me, us, tonight. And I was going to talk to you all about um, our reopening plan and, and sort of how we started the semester. But obviously, given the events of the last week and a half, I just wanted to really update you on where we're at now, what we're doing, and answer any questions uh, that you might have. John, if I'm getting close to time, just wave at me and, and I will shut up. So just a quick recap to start how we got to where we are now. We are uh, four weeks into the semester. Uh, we began on time, August 24th, and we are going to end early at Thanksgiving. That means no days off, no Labor Day, um, no religious holidays, uh, no fall break in October. We are going straight through until Thanksgiving uh, to send our students home, hopefully on time, healthy, and they'll participate in exams remotely after Thanksgiving. So uh, the res halls will close. Uh, the apartments will remain open for students who are living in the apartments, but we expect that um, not many will be returning. Uh, prior to coming back, all students who were coming back to campus for any reason, whether because they were living on campus, working on campus, um, living off campus, but taking a class on campus, had to show proof of a negative COVID test. Um, they also had to sign a mandatory conduct pledge. And uh, more recently, uh, they are required uh, to participate in our surveillance testing program, which I will talk about a bit in a minute. Uh, this is a new development this week, all UUP. Uh, represented faculty and staff, that's our largest on-campus union, uh, including me, uh, must participate in the surveillance testing program. Uh, prior to that, faculty and staff were strongly encouraged, but uh, now it is, it is required. Uh, where we're at on campus right now, our residence halls are somewhere between 50 and 51 percent uh, full, uh, much, much lower than they typically are. Just using rough numbers, we have about 4,000 students living in on-campus dorms or apartments. And in a normal year, our theoretical max capacity would be about 7,800. So many, many fewer, fewer students living on campus. Uh, big reason for that is about 60% of our classes are fully remote. Uh, so um, many students, once the schedules were finalized, just decided to stay home. Um, all in, we have a, what we call an on-campus population of about 11,500. Um, that's uh, students living on campus, students with at least one class on campus, and faculty, staff who've been on campus at least once since the semester began. Now that number dramatically overstates it. 
because, you know, for instance, that includes me. I've officially been on campus four times in four weeks. So um, we never have that many people on campus at any one time. It's, um, but it's the theoretical ceiling. Um, all our, the states and the governor's New York public health orders, the mass, the distancing, um, crowd size, uh, we, they are enforceable under our code of conduct for students. So their conduct pledge aside, we have the ability to force those orders through our code of conduct and we have and will do that. And uh, there are significant penalties for violating it. Um, and if there are detailed questions about that, that's certainly something we can go uh, further into. So where are we now? Um, as you've no doubt read or seen, uh, we are managing an outbreak on campus and in communities connected to our campus. Uh, I just updated this minutes before we came on with the new data from today. We have 90 cases in the last two weeks. Um, all of them are among students. Uh, it's roughly 50-50 on off campus, slightly more off campus. Um, and as, as you probably read last week, athletics is impacted. Um, we are uh, working daily with Albany County Department of Health on testing, tracking, and tracing. But we're not just trading numbers. Uh, we talk to them on a daily basis, if not more, about trends within the data. Understandably, the media and the general public, they're interested in the top line number. But the top line number only tells you so much. There could be things happening within that data that are actually very useful for informing our response. And those are the kinds of things that we're constantly talking to the county about. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize too, that we did not think we were gonna go throughout the entire semester without a case. We knew there would be cases. And that's why we spent the last six to seven months preparing for what we do when that happened. And, and really what's significant now is how we're executing on the plan that that we built and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So most immediately, what are we doing? Um, we not only accelerated our pool testing program, which is we started it a little bit sooner than we planned, but we increased the frequency of testing. So, um, you know, on campus students now are going to be tested um, every two weeks rather than every month and athletes are being tested every week. Um, we indefinitely shut down all athletic related activity. That's strength training, practicing, our teams are not going to be getting together as groups uh, until we're confident that we have contained this. Um, in addition to our regular pool testing, which again, I'll talk about in a minute, we did an extra surge of testing. I think it was about 390 to 400 samples we collected when we first became aware of this cluster late last week. And, and that's because we really wanted to get our arms around how widespread the issue was. Um, we did that late last week. And in part, that's why you saw um, a jump in our numbers earlier this week that you probably read about in the media. Now, we never want those numbers to go up, but I am going to tell you that's a good thing because those are all asymptomatic cases that we caught. People who were walking around who didn't know they were sick, but through our surveillance testing program, we got them. So again, we wish they were not there, but it's, it's a symptom of the system working the way we designed it to work. And, um, so once we get positives, we are uh, working immediately with the county um, on the proper notifications to quarantine them, to isolate them as necessary, um, remove them from the general population, and then support them you know, throughout the duration of their stay, either in isolation or quarantine. Um, I mentioned before, you know, we are, and we're not gonna be shy about it, um, sanctioning students who are not doing the right thing. I do want to say the vast majority of them are, but in a pandemic, the vast majority is not enough. Uh, but we're also doing proactive outreach. We're not just, um, you know, we're not just using the stick. Uh, Luke's, Luke's office, Luke personally, his staff, his off-campus ambassadors have done a lot of proactive outreach. Um, they distributed several hundred uh, test kits in Midtown last weekend and have been going, I think that thousands of masks they distributed early in the semester and really about educating uh, our off-campus population about why it's important for them to participate in the surveillance testing program. It is required of them. And if they don't, they will be um, uh, potentially deregistered from their classes, which is a significant penalty because that messes up your academic trajectory significantly at this point. Um, but just trying to educate them about why it is important. And then, as always, this is not new, uh, working closely with APD and other city agencies, codes, and others in Midtown, um, 
to get a handle on what is happening off campus. And what I've told in speaking to a lot of media lately, really what I've said to them is that the process of what we're doing now in Midtown is not fundamentally different from any other year. But the number of things that our students are accountable for is much larger, uh, which is why we've seen a great many more uh, conduct referrals coming out of Midtown than you would in a, in a normal year. So uh, some of you may know already about pooled testing, but I just want to talk a little bit about it because it's so important to our broader plan to um, control the spread of the virus on campus. What it does is allows us to test more people faster and less expensively. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it catches those asymptomatic cases that we wouldn't or otherwise know were out there. So if you're symptomatic, we don't want you to be in the pool testing system. You know, you go right to a diagnostic test, the big nasal swab that we've all seen. Um, the pool testing is to catch all these other folks who just don't know because of the way this virus in its insidiousness is that you can be or appear perfectly healthy and not know you're sick. So our RNA Institute and our School of Public Health in a matter of months, and that was, I mean, just remarkable, um, totally shifted gears and set up a testing lab on our campus where one didn't exist before and um, developed uh, by drawing on some expertise that had been developed at other universities, a testing protocol that allows us to test um, what we're building up to 5,000 uh, samples a week, which is pretty significant. And what we do is we take samples from multiple people, uh, typically either in pools of two or four, depending on the situation, and we combine them and we test that one sample. The sample comes back clear, all people in that pool, whether it's two or four or other, other campuses are doing 12, you're clear. If that sample comes back presumptively positive is the term we use, um, then all the people in that pool, whether it's two or four or 12, are referred for diagnostic testing, the nasal swab of the nose. And um, in our system, somebody who's involved in a presumptively positive pool becomes what we call a PUI, a person under investigation. So that's where our support services kick in, where we arrange um, uh, quarantine housing for them in the interim. We make sure that they have access to a diagnostic test. Because what we want then is to confirm a positive if it is in fact positive, get them into isolation and get them on the road to recovery and, and return to the community. So uh, this, the system that our folks are using has a less than 0.3% um, false positive rate, which is great. Uh, it means we have a lot of confidence in it. And um, you know, as we ramp it up, we're gonna get really good coverage. I have my, uh, this is what it looks like. Everybody who's participating gets uh, a kit like this. We have like an army of volunteers putting together somewhere between 15 and 25,000 of them to distribute to our community. Um, these are what you've probably saw Luke staff distributing in Midtown. And there's a lot of little tubes in there. You spit into them, you drop it in a mailbox like thing in a sanitary bag, and it goes to the lab and, and, and hopefully comes back negative. So uh, another good tool I think for uh, the campus and our broader community is our campus dashboard, which I'm just gonna move my windows here so I can see it. This is a good way um, for folks to keep track of where we are in general and relative to um, the standards that have been set by the New York State Department of Health when we could have to shift to fully remote learning. So uh, I'm, I have a couple of links here. I'm only gonna focus on our dashboard. SUNY also has a dashboard, which has much, much more information on it than ours does, but ours really kind of distills it to, I think what things are most useful for most people. And Albany County also has a, has a really useful dashboard. The point I wanna make about these three though, is that they will seldom match up and that's okay. Um, generally speaking, Albany County's reporting will lag hours by about a day. So I think the county announced 18 cases associated with UAlbany this morning. Those were already in our tracker yesterday. So it's not 18 on top of the 46 we had this morning. Those 18 were already included. And that's the county's not doing anything wrong. Um, they just have a different system and they have to do an investigation prior to counting it as an Albany County case that, that we don't do. Once we see a positive case that's associated with us, we add it to our dashboard and, and we count it. So um, it's all good information. 
I encourage you to look at them all, but don't try to crosswalk them because you'll drive yourself crazy. But what I can tell you is the top line numbers on our dashboard, which I'll show you now, will always be the most current information about where we're at on our campus. So I'm just going to swap over here. Can everybody see this? Somebody give me a thumbs up. Good, okay, great. So I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, you can get to this dashboard. I'll share the link directly with John, but you can get to it by just going to albany.edu, clicking on our COVID-19 homepage, and then there's a tab at the top that says UAlbany COVID-19 dashboard. So the two, I think, most useful and interesting numbers to the community are the ones at the top. This one shows you how many cases we have between a set two-week window the current two week window, September 12th and September 25th. This is the window that will determine whether or not we have to shift to remote learning. If we reach 100 cases in this window, State Department of Health says automatically we shift to remote learning, fully remote learning. So that's what that top line number means. This number is a rolling 14 days. So this number tells you how many cases we have in the 14 days leading up to today. They're two slightly different metrics. If you're interested in how close we are to that pivot number, this is the one you want. If you're just interested in what's happened in the last two weeks, this is the number that you want. So as you can see, we've got, we're 50 into the 100 for the two week window, and that we have 90 cases over the last 14 days generally. At the bottom of the dashboard, there's additional um, information about the number of tests happening on campus, um, the bottom number talks about the pool testing system. One thing I just wanna point out, because I know people get nervous when they see it, you'll see that the student health center number for positive testing, is the positive rate is 11.5%, and you would be reasonable to look at that and say, oh my gosh. The one caution that I wanna offer you, and we have it here in a note under it, is that those are just the positive tests from student being tested in our student health center. And the reason that can be misleading is that students who are being tested there may be more likely to test positive because either they're exhibiting symptoms, they're known to have been in contact with somebody who was positive, or they were referred there for follow-up testing after being flagged in our pool system. So I just want to caution you against using this percentage to extrapolate that student body wide or UAlbany community wide the positivity rate is 11 and percent. It just, this number doesn't have enough information to do that, but we offer it anyway, just because for the sake of transparency. All right, so I'm gonna stop talking about numbers and get back here. Everybody see the PowerPoint again? So what's next? Um, we're gonna keep testing. Uh, like I said, we increase the frequency for everyone and especially athletes. Um, as I mentioned, there's this two week window. If we reach 100 cases in that window before the 25th, we will automatically shift to remote learning for two weeks. Um, as of today, we're at 50. Our students would remain on campus. Uh, they would just take their remote courses from their dorms or apartments. And really the purpose of the two week window, the two week pause is what we call it, is to um, give us time to test more, to reduce student contact, and see if we've got our arms around it. And then at the end of that two week period, we would reevaluate with the Albany County Department of Health, with the State Department of Health, and certainly with SUNY, and figure out where we go. It isn't automatic that we'd restart in person after those two weeks are up. Our hope is that would be the case, but it really depends on what those numbers from all the testing we're gonna do over those two weeks tell us about what the situation is. So that's where we're at now, uh, I am happy to answer any questions. I'm looking, I'm just scrolling down to look at my colleague Kevin to see if he thinks I uh, mischaracterized anything or left anything critical out. He's shaking his head, so happy to. Uh, Thank you, Jordan. Uh, so if you have the facility to raise your hand, either actually or virtually, <clears throat> please do so. All right, Marilyn, uh, if you would unmute, go ahead and ask your question. 
you need to unmute yourself, Marilyn. Just click the red microphone with a slash through it. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? And we can see you too. So you're on. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jordan, I was just wondering, what's, what's the story on your international students? Are there any on campus? Are they uh, in their own homes or what's, what's the story? Uh, we do have some, many, many fewer than normally uh, for um, a number of reasons, some that have to do with COVID-19 and some just have to do with the geopolitical climate in recent years. Uh, but those that were able uh, to travel and return uh, were permitted to, presuming that they, um, you know, they had to adhere to whatever um, quarantine rules were in effect if they were coming from, a, I think, a level three CDC travel advisory country. Some never went home. Um, you know, travel became very difficult in yeah. the spring for everyone. So uh, there are some, uh, I don't know exact numbers. I'm, uh, Kevin, Kevin might be more plugged in on that, but uh, those that were able to make it back are, were able to come back, assuming they were willing to adhere to, um, you know, the state's uh, travel restrictions. Okay, thank you. Carolyn Keith, I'm sorry, I was muted myself. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, pardon me, I'm having audio issues. So we can hear um, you. We can hear okay. you. Okay, I'm hearing me twice. Um, Jordan, my question is that you you may have heard heard or seen videos of a police officer talking to a student in a different town and from a different university who was supposed to be quarantined and did, clearly did not understand what that meant. Um, what kind of education are we giving to students who live off campus about what quarantining really means in terms of not only are they not supposed to go anywhere, but who, where um, whoever they are um, uh, seeing is not supposed, you know, they're not supposed to have people into their house. So, that's so that's what, a, that's, that's a very question. that's a very good question right so we those of us who've been dealing with this or living with it for seven or eight months you know we have a certain level of assumed knowledge that we should not assume everybody has uh i wish i, I don't have the link up but actually just within uh we, we've always been providing that information to students uh, especially because uh, we needed to be very explicit about it when our out-of-state and international students were returning in mid-august about what it meant. And what the state means by quarantine is, if it's not an emergency, you don't leave your quarantine location. Uh, so we've always been providing that, as has Albany County, because I think it's also important to note that we're not um, the only contact that are our, our students who are either in um, per, you know, uh, precautionary quarantine or in isolation have. Um, Albany County Department of Health, which I have to plug, has, has been an incredibly, um, just capable and accessible partner in all this, um, they, they deliver that information as well. All that aside, we actually just developed um, a new website that goes into explicit detail for students, not just about um, what quarantining means and how isolation works, but what the process is. So what happens if your pool is flagged as presumptively positive, what is gonna happen next? And this is honestly as much for um, students as it is for parents because they have a certain level of anxiety about it as well. Um, so that is, Carolyn, it's something that we're always um, improving upon, right? Because we don't know what they don't know. And then we start interacting with students and we start seeing where the, the gaps are. Um, and I'll just say this now, because somebody may ask, you know, somebody who, uh, you know, deliberately and knowingly disregards quarantine and isolation, that is a serious, serious violation of our code of conduct. I mean, that would be um, met with a pretty serious sanction. Um, I just have a follow up. Um, so Jordan, when they're in quarantine and isolation, if they live off campus, is, um, is the university following up with them daily 
Is ACO, ACDOH following up with them daily? Are both following up and just reminding? Because I think we, we know that it takes a long time for a message to, sit, to, to really sink in. So, and, and you know, it, it can be tempting for kids to just be like, oh, well, they said I had to stay home. They didn't say I couldn't have, you know, 10 friends over, that kind of thing. Um, or, oh, yeah, they said I'm not supposed to have people over. They didn't really mean I'm not supposed to have these people, you know, that kind of thing. So, so a couple things. Um, generally, with the off-campus population, it's going to be um, Albany County Department of Health that's following up on a daily basis, as they would if it were me or you or... Um, we do have, and this is an issue that came up, and, and I think credit to the city too, who raised this, uh, which raised this, you know, in a discussion earlier this week. We, we don't, not all of our off-campus students are necessarily in a position to safely quarantine or effectively quarantine or isolate off-campus. And so while if you're an off-campus student, our preference is going to be, you should do that in your off-campus residence. Um, you know, we do have some flexibility to make accommodations if it's absolutely not possible. Um, I want to, I'm just going to scroll down and look at Kevin to see if I've missed anything here that I uh, should say. He's shaking his head. Um, we do have, um, you know, but I also want to say, I want to plug for Luke's office, um, you know, any additional eyes and ears we have on the streets, we appreciate. Um, if, if for whatever reason you see somebody who you think for whatever reason is supposed to be quarantined and they're not, uh, or you see them at the store, please let Luke or me know. Um, you know, I'm not privy to names, nor should I be, but we have people on our campus who can follow up. And I can tell you, uh, you know, there's at least one example where we have been able to assist Albany County Department of Health in tracking somebody down who was uh, um, just hard to get on the phone, I guess we'll say. And, and I will follow up, and if everybody can hear me, um, I will follow up and say also Albany County so they have someone who is broke deal with that um, and they do follow up with the off campus students on a regular basis um, and, and to where they are. We're also seeing a lot of students going home um, when they become ill they, they are, or they're into quarantine <clears throat> more on campus than off but even some off I think because it's more comfortable at home. Um, uh, and I will say this, I'm one of the people that actually to fill in here this week has been calling students when we're telling them that they have come up in a presumptive, uh, presumptive positive pool or they are positive. Um, and we do explain very well what quarantine means to them. But I've also found that they're somewhat to my surprise, they're very conscious of their roommates and the safety of their roommates. Um, which is helpful and a little bit, you know, um, has been a little bit uh, heartening as we go through this, that they're actually thinking about this kind of thing. I, yeah, I mean, one thing I would also add to just generally is, and I always have to remind myself this, is that such a huge percentage of our students come from the New York City area that they went home in March to the worst of it and lived it for two and a half months. And, and that's why, I mean, I'm not just saying oh, most people are following the rules. I mean, the vast majority are because they have that experience. Now, I also will say, you know, in any normal year, you get 95% compliance, you high five each other and say, we did a great job. 95 isn't, isn't good enough. So we're, we're, we're going after the other five proactively with carrots and sticks. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, I'm not seeing any other quest hands up, but I have a question. If, I don't know if you can easily go back to the slide with the dashboard numbers, the September 12th to 25th window is compared to the rolling average. Uh, there was some discussion of that in the newspaper article. And I think you explained it, but I just, I just wanna drill down a little, make sure I understand it. So there's a period September 12th and 25th and, and one question for you is, well, where did that window come from? But that's the one, if you go over hundred, you'll have to shut down. And then for the rolling uh, two week average, you now have uh, 90, it looks like, right? Yeah, if I'm adding correctly. So it's now September 17th. So you're five days into this 12th to 25th uh, window. If I extrapolate just simplistically, it would go to well over 100. So uh, not that you can project or I can sitting here doing it this way, but 
one, where did the, did the 12th and 25th window come from? And, and why is that so different from the rolling uh, two week average or significantly lower at this point? So uh, these are all good questions. So the, the two week windows and the dates for them were established by uh, New York State Department of Health and uh, SUNY. And the logic to them is really no more complicated than, uh, so the first day of our semester was uh, the 24th, but not every SUNY school started on that day. And so roughly they track in two week blocks from the start of most, because this doesn't even just apply to SUNY schools. This applies to all colleges and universities in the state. So they roughly track in just regular two week blocks from the start of the semester through Thanksgiving when pretty much everybody, if not everybody is going home for good. So the 12th and 25th, it just happens to be the second block. Um, uh, your second question was why the difference and what happens if we extrapolate? Was that the? Right. Yeah. Well, I don't have a doctorate in public health. Uh, luckily, we have a school of public health that has um, uh, many of them. And we have a very, very good uh, department of public health in the county. And so, you know, when I say they're not just trading numbers every day, that's what they're looking at. So, you know, these are static numbers, which are sort of useful to orient ourselves in time. But these numbers don't really tell you what's happening below the surface in terms of, you know, if you have 10 new cases, are they just evenly distributed across the campus or are they all in one place? Is it a cluster? Um, and that is what our, our, our public health school's role in our surveillance testing process is really to help our campus try to make sense of what's going on beneath the surface and the numbers and sort of share that intel and trade insights with the Albany County Department of Health. So, and the reason I say this is because there's understandably this sort of uh, focus on the 100 threshold, but nobody is just sitting here hitting refresh waiting to hit 100. If, if we saw something in the numbers below that threshold, you know, like say we're at 70, but there was something truly alarming or something we could not explain or concerning in those numbers, there's nothing that would stop us from acting sooner. And, and I think that um, a good roadmap for this is sort of what happened last week when we saw that first spike. Um, you know, immediately it triggered a call with the Department of Health and the Department of Health came with some very useful, helpful recommendations, suggestions about actions we needed to take immediately. Um, and we did that. And that wasn't required by any way. There was no, there was no threshold at which we had to shut down athletic activity. We just said, hey, this is concerning. We need more information. We're going to do this. And so, you know, it, it, the difference between the 14 days and, and this window, as I mentioned, uh, the rolling 14 days, that is, in this static window, as I mentioned, a lot of the positives that we're seeing earlier this week is actually a result of increased testing we did last week in the last window. So, um, right. you know, I think what our, what our experts are looking at now is to see now what's happening. We knew there was going to be an increase from that surge testing we did. We wiped out all those asymptomatic cases or took them off out of circulation. Um, so now what happens to the numbers next? And, and really, I think, well, I'm not an, an epidemiologist. I think, you know, the next, you know, three, four days are really going to give us a lot of information about where we're headed relative to that, um, uh, to that 100 number. I also want to point out, the, the pivot to remote learning is like not punitive. It's just another tool to help us contain the virus. So if obviously we don't want to do it, but we won't hesitate. I mean, whether we hit that 100 threshold or we see something below that threshold that merits sooner action, we'll absolutely do it. Because I mean, we're all, we, we all want to contain it. And, and you know, uh, there was one thing I will say that sort of bugged me in one of the stories was a suggestion that, and it wasn't about us, but that a campus might just stop testing to stay under that threshold, which I mean, if you want to be, and I was a reporter, so I'm naturally a little bit cynical, sure. But I mean, doing that would be ethically bankrupt. We, we all live in this community. I mean, we're not, we want to see it contained. We want to see our semester conclude in a healthy way in thanks, at Thanksgiving. And we want to you know, reopen uh, more fully, we hope, in the spring. And so no, no one is going to play with the numbers. I mean, they are what they are. And if we have to pivot, we'll do it. So sorry, yeah, I was Jordan. Wondering. Jordan, one thing that's very important is that when you look in the numbers, and this will help folks understand a little bit about what we mean by looking inside the numbers, 
one of the things an epidemiologist or anyone uh, tracking this, looking at the severity, and, and 50 that we have here can be two very different 50s. I'll give you an example. If we know where 40 of those 50 cases came from, which means we can track it back to an event or we can track it back to an individual. That's what the contact tracers in the state and the county do. And we also have about 10 trained contact tracers on our campus um, that we've put through John Hopkins training for contact tracing to assist the county and jump on things early um, if we can take a, a, a positive person out of circulation faster. If we know where 45 or 40 of those 50 came from and we can track them, <clears throat> to someone who was symptomatic, someone who was ill, to an event where someone was there, that's good. We know where they're coming from. When it gets scary and when it's a different 50 is when we can't tell where they came from. And what that means is you've got a community spread going on under the surface. And this is what happened in New York City very early on. If you remember, they had the bloom in Westchester County. What they did not know was going on. And so they knew they had that bloom. They contained that bloom. They, they surrounded it. They closed the town off and all that. What they didn't know was going on was in New York City at the same time, it was growing underground, not attached to any single event, et cetera, until it exploded and popped up to, and they started to discover that. So if we, again, that's what the contact tracing really does is to take people out of circulation, but also to be able to tell you, do you know where it came from? And that's critically important. What helps us in the underground potential growth is the, surve the surveillance testing, because we're testing asymptomatic people, not people that are sick, not people attached to event. In fact, we're not testing them through the pooling because if they're positive, you will set the pool off. We're looking to measure um, what's going on among the general population. And we don't do that in clusters. We do that very uh, randomly. So we get pieces from across the campus, on off campus, faculty, staff, et cetera. So we can keep an eye on, hopefully, this is the idea of what's going on under the surface. So that's where the 250 numbers, if, I, if you were, a 50 can be a 50 that's really, none of them are good, but a 50 can be a better 50 than another one if you, if you know where it's coming from. Un understood. Uh, thank you, Jordan and Kevin. I am not seeing any uh, more hands raised, but Lori, if you see anyone, let me know. And Jordan, in the meantime, if you could take off the screen sharing from your end. Thank you. Any if anybody has any questions, by the way, I mean, uh, John, feel free to right, read my email. And... Afterwards, sure. Yeah. Hey, this is Eric. I just had a, um, a question um, on the construction projects on the campus. I know it's not directly this stuff, but if that's been impacted by, um, you know, the, how they're going, first of all, and then how that's, um, you know, how they're, how they're going. And then on, on the 50, do we know, like, which category they're, the 50, do we know which, are they traceable or are they not traceable yeah, yeah. or the unknown? So that's just, you know. For the most part, uh, the, the 50 is traceable. As Jordan said, a lot of those are still coming out of late last week's testing um, that we knew we had a bloom within a certain social group. And that's what you generally find on college campuses. Uh, athletics, I don't want to pick on them. Athletics is a social group in many ways, just like a fraternity or just like a, a club or anything else. They all hang out together. So if you do pick up a positive case, you're going to have a bloom there. Some campuses have seen it happening in fraternities. Some happen in learning living, living learning communities. This one just happened to be an athletic for us. They all hang out together. You get a couple positive cases, boom, it, it takes off. So that's why we tested every single athlete on the campus. And we are doing that weekly, actually, by the way, now. Um, and for the athletes. And most, a lot of these are associated, not all of them. Um, but a lot of them are, and a lot of the other ones, we can track back to a individual case. We've had, I'm not sure, to my knowledge, um, well, we've probably had a few, but very, very few where we can't say exactly where it came from. Very, very few. And I'm happy to talk about anything other than COVID-19. So construction, uh, we, did, we did lose some weeks on ETEC Uptown on the Harriman campus. Um, uh, but they're uh, back on track. I was out there yesterday because they're, starting to do some landscaping uh, for our, our friends in the Eagle uh, Hill Neighborhood Association. Uh, so that's still on track for completion um, summer uh, 2021. Uh, they were ahead of schedule, so we, we did okay there. Um, Skylar lost some time too. Uh, bigger issue with Skylar though uh, is we have to rebid the next phase of construction. Uh, we bid it 
just our luck in February when all hell was breaking loose and um, the bids came back weird. Um, they were, they were high beyond all reason and, and likely because there was so much, I think it was bid in February and uh, our head of facilities was saying, you know, everybody was uncertain about labor, about supply chains, construction materials. So that's being rebid in October um, or at some point this fall, I have to confirm, I believe it's October, but we will, um, I'm happy to report back on that. It'll, it'll cost us some months in terms of completion of the first phase, but realistically speaking, even if we had accepted bids in February or March, given that everything was gridlocked, I don't know that we would have, we're losing all that much more time than we would have anyway, because nothing moved quickly. Um, and, and, and there's a, Kevin, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but there's a freeze on state capital spending, new capital expenditures in association with the, the, the budget crunch. So uh, long story short, I don't know that we actually lost all that much time. Thank you. Any other questions for Jordan and Kevin? All right, well, thanks very much. Very much appreciated, Thank great you. answers and uh, good information. So uh, we are going to go now to David Gallon, uh, Mayor Sheehan's uh, Chief of Staff, who's going to give us an update on census. For some reason, Jordan is still on the screen. I'm not sure why. David, could you unmute yourself? Sure. There we Thank go. you, John. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give a brief update on where we're at with uh, the census uh, in terms of count, uh, we are winding down. We've got about uh, 14 days left, 13 days really. Uh, we The count does end on September 30th. Uh, I know there's a some uh, court cases that are moving their way through the system, but we're, we're assuming that nothing is going to change and that uh, the the census count itself will end on September 30th. So we're, we're uh, really putting the pedal to the floor the last two weeks here to get uh, everyone counted. Um, we're trying very hard to uh, ensure that we're hitting the, the neighborhoods with the uh, lowest response rate right now, which is West Hill, uh, Arbor Hill, the South End, uh, a bit of Pine Hills. Uh, there is still a, a, a portion where you've, your, your uh, census tract has moved into the blue, but it's just barely into the blue. So that means you're, you're uh, a little over 40%, which is great, but um, still not at the... Uh, Still not at the level that we want to be. So um, that is that's uh, what we've been focusing on right now. Citywide, we're at about a fifty-four percent response, self-response rate. Uh, in twenty ten, we were at about sixty-three percent. Um, but the one misleading factor here is that uh, the the census workers who are going around door to door as we speak, uh, who work for the federal census bureau. Um, those those folks who are uh, counting residents, uh, their their counts does not go toward the fifty four percent mark. So in theory, our our response rate is higher. We just don't know what it is because the Census Bureau doesn't provide that information. So um, it is a little bit of a mystery, but um, we are working very hard to ensure that we uh, get people out. You know, COVID really put a damper on our plans. We were we had. Uh, census bingo, we had uh, barbershop talks, we had a lot of in-person events. We were gonna be at all the school concerts, we were gonna be at uh, uh, graduations, et cetera. Um, really, really focusing our efforts in the community, uh, working with SUNY, who has been a great partner on the Complete Count Committee since day one. Um, you know, Jordan and, and Luke have been very, very active um, and very helpful, so I just wanna give them a shout out as well. Um, but the, you know, once COVID, uh, set in, we really had to adjust our our uh, our tax. So we moved to a more digital uh, effort. We, uh, I'm guessing, some of you have seen the uh, some of the census memes that we we did a couple weeks ago um, to try to spur the conversation. And I, um, from from what I gather, it worked because a lot of people uh, noticed them and, and definitely were talking about the census, which is good. Um, that was the whole point. So it. Uh, we, we just want to continue these last you know 13 days or so. Uh, if you haven't filled out your census yet, please do. Um, if you know of people who haven't, please encourage them to do so because uh, every person that's not counted in the census costs the city and state. 
about $2,000 a year over the next 10 years. So um, we're talking about millions, um, really, really billions of dollars when you take into account the entire city. Um, and, and every person really does count. We, we, if, if we lose population proportionally to colony or other uh, surrounding municipalities, our sales tax proportion will decrease, which will cost the city money and again, resources. Um, state funding, federal funding, it's all dictated upon uh, the census. We, we actually, um, we were able to, our CARES funding was dictated by the census. It's all, it's all based on a formula and uh, the more folks we get counted, the, the better for the city of Albany as a whole and for our future. So um, we, if, you, if you're interested in volunteering and you're interested in doing a lit drop, a door hanger drop, we're happy to, uh, we're happy to provide you with those materials and, and locations where we still need folks to um, hang door hangers. So feel free to email me. Uh, I'll put my email in the chat afterwards. That way you, you have it. Um, again, we, any, any help uh, you're, you're able to provide, we will take, even if it's uh, one street, we'll, we'll get you the door hangers. And if you can hang the door hangers on one street, we'll, we'll take it. So um Again, it's, it's really, really important that you're talking to your neighbors, letting them know the importance of the census and just it, really encouraging them to fill it out. There's 13 more days, it takes five minutes. Um, there's, there's no excuse. Uh, it's very, very easy. Um, it's safe and it's super important to our entire city. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, take, I'll open up to questions uh, and go from there. Thank you, David. Uh, any questions? It's a good update, although more things to worry about, I guess, right? Sorry, and I don't have did, better news. We did, as you know, distribute uh, uh, the door hangers on a number of blocks we thought would yeah. be most likely to not be fully counted. Mm -hmm. If you have specific areas that you know of that still need that, send them in to me, David, and, and we'll try and see if we can get some people to help. Okay. We'll do. We'll do. And I, I know there's a couple of hands being raised, but yes, I just want to, I do want to say, John, John, uh, in the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association, I think you were one of the first ones, uh, period, to to uh, reach out and, and get door hangers from us and do a lit drop. So I really want to give you all a shout out for those that helped. You know, thank you. Um, we, we really do appreciate it. And we'll certainly get you those uh, more targeted areas uh, for this last round. Thanks. Leah? Oh, yeah. Thanks so much, David. And thanks, John. Um, so we I completed our census online months ago. And then a few weeks ago, we received a note on our door from uh, I'm assuming a census enumerator uh, saying that our uh, you know, they didn't have our information essentially. I did, I have not yet gone back in, but I have heard that this is an issue that we're not the only people that this has happened to. And I was wondering if you, um, you know, what you know about this situation, Davis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, it, it could be a variety of things. Uh, I don't know if your, your home used to be a two unit and it now is a one unit, um, that could be part of it. Uh, the other thing that seems to be happening is they do quality checks where uh, if your address, uh, let's say you live on a, on a, uh, a road where it's technically called a terrace, you know, sometimes they come back and check to see whether uh, you spell it and they can, they basically confirm whether it's T E R R or they spell out the entire word or it's, Sometimes uh, the difference between ST and street um, sets off a quality check. So it, it could be a variety of things. Uh, it is just, it's very concerning because we've heard this across the city um, and from a number of people who have said, I filled out the census right in the beginning and now they're coming back to my house two or three times later. Um, and we're worried that, you know, obviously they're wasting resources following up with folks who have already filled out their census when they should be um, focusing on the areas where the response rate is super low. And, and I will say we, um, we actually, the mayor got a, a, a the, the secretary of commerce, Wilbur uh, Ross reached out to the mayor uh, about a month ago when um, our response rate was lo much lower than it is now and was expressed concern about what was going on in Albany. And we, we told them, we were like, you know, we're hearing that the census enumerators are in the neighborhoods where the census count is very, very high. Why aren't they in the neighborhoods where the census count is low? And 
basically the the answer more or less was you know they, they cover everywhere um you, you know you might see them in certain places where you don't think they should be but they're doing quality checks they're following up um, but they are everywhere so um, we did express concern that we were basically like look like you 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 can get a lot more people in a neighborhood where the response rate is just 30 percent as compared to 80 percent but um you know i don't i don't think they took our I don't think they listen to us, long story short, but um, they are, the, the, the Census Bureau does say they're everywhere. They are doing these quality checks and um, it could be a variety of things is the, the long and short of it. Good. Uh, Christine, if you could. Hi, Hi. thanks. Um, thank you all for listening to me. David, I agree with the census. I think it's incredibly important. I also agree with Leah. I've had more than um, two people come to my door and I did it the first thing that it was available. But interestingly enough, the last time they were at my door, I'm just curious, um, and not that I didn't agree to do it, I answered questions about my next door neighbor who are renters and the uh, person at the door, she said this is perfectly okay. And I said, well, if it is, it is. So, and so I answered on behalf of a neighbor. I'm just curious if that is, and I would love for them to be counted because there's a lot of people living there um, as renters. And I, I just, I'm, I, I'm curious from the census person. So David, is that like, what is, is that okay? That I'm answering on behalf of a neighbor that I don't know? And I've never met. I, I'm not actually sure, but I will say that I won't call the Census Bureau and ask them. And I, no, me and believe me, <laughs> I'm more than happy to add to the numbers because I know how important it is. But it was just so odd that you said only if you know. And I said they, they come and go. It's a transient house. I, I, you know. And she said just to the best of your ability. And she clearly was a census person, but she's not. She's working more not for the Fed. Fed. So anyway, I answered was she the a census? What, what, did, did she have like a census badge? Was she an yeah. actual census employee? She had a census badge, yeah, and, and a mask and was lovely. And I, but I was like, I don't really know. It's a very transient rental house and um, to the best of your ability. So I'm just curious if you knew whether those are gonna be counted. I hope they are, by the way. I mean, so, I hope they're counted too, um, yeah, but really. I won't. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell the Census Bureau that that happened. Okay. I, but I'm, I'm really not. No, it's fine. I, and again, I, with Leah, I agree with Leah. I've been like requested three times when I already answered early on. So, and now you're frozen. Ah, you froze up on me. So, okay, bye. <laughs> Virginia, do, do you still have a question, Virginia Hammer? Um, well, I'm not sure anymore. I, I guess I was wondering what the hangers actually said. Uh, were they just to make sure that you have actually filled out the census? So it's not necessarily given to people who have or have not. It was just a reminder to everybody. Or it was. It was. It, it was just a drop. Uh, reminding people that they needed to do it and how they could do it online. It wasn't targeted in any way to who had not filled it out. So when I said we tried to go to neighborhoods that we just presumed might be harder to get, you know, we were thinking of multifamily units, uh, areas with, with, with many transitory people, with immigrant populations. So we, we aimed for those, or at least I did. But uh, David is going to share with us what he can about neighborhoods that might not have been uh, that are still not doing well and we might drop it again it doesn't really it's not an individualized communication okay so i was just wondering if that would confuse people but i guess not it would just say that if you haven't you should and right. the enumerator would still come if they got around to it to that neighborhood to try to get those people to sign sign on or get the information right is David still, David, if you can answer that, but I guess I'd broaden the question too. Everything you've been saying that I've been hearing me, I mean, does it, does it really appear to be that the Census Bureau will just pack them and say, okay, we haven't counted at all and we know it, but we're out of time and we're done. Is, is that yeah. what could happen? Shit. Not good. 
Well, we may have lost David. <laughs> and I don't know why. I didn't do it. <laughs> he's there, but he's muted. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, John. Oh, he's I back. Hear, I didn't okay. hear the first half of the question. I apologize. The internet kicked out. Uh, well, the question was, or Virginia was asking about the uh, the door hangers, which I answered. We were just distributing them everywhere to remind people that they should file themselves if they can, if the enumerator hasn't already been there, and how they, the various ways they could do it. Uh, but we sort of, between the two of us, said, well, but the, I guess what is concerning, and, and this seems to be what you're saying, but is it just... Will the Census Bureau pack up and leave town at the end of month, even if they know that they really haven't counted a lot of people? I mean, we, I mean, we think so. Yeah, we, we think they'll just, uh, barring a court order, we are under the assumption that on September or, or on October 1st, we will, they will just done. go back into the uh, abyss and we'll never see them again. Well, for not for another 10 years, I should say. Not good. Uh, I mean, again, I know folk, uh, there are cases that are trying to to push the the deadline back to October, either the end of October. But we're not we're not holding our breath, um, unfortunately. Okay, Carolyn, if you still have a question, I do. Um, sorry. Uh, a couple of things. One is I know there are new signs out there that says if you haven't uh, done your, if you haven't done the census, um, please do. So if those are still available, how, how do we get them? The other is I had sort of the opposite react experience to um, Christine and Leah. I had somebody, uh, an enumerator came by and was asking me about a house that I know belongs to the College of St. Rose and I know is vacant. Um, and so I said, well, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that's vacant and this is, it belongs to the College of St. Rose. And then another, and I said, if you have any other questions and I gave her my contact information, I said, if you guys need help with talking to neighbors, whatever, I'm happy to help. Um, and then another enumerator came by who was actually the person who had already enumerated a vacant building to, to ask me about that. And I said, I know it belongs to the College of St. Rose. I showed her how to both look up the um, every property uh, that the web the city has on the um, on the codes I think website um, to find out who the owner is for for a property and I also showed her the vacant building list but I'm hoping they're not spending a lot of energy on buildings known to be vacant and are spending a little more energy on actually counting places um, and do they have access to those resources she didn't even know those resources existed which obviously is more of a concern of something that, that the Census Bureau should be training them about, but are they familiar with those resources? Uh, we've, we've made it available, but for basically the answer we were given was that um, they have to check, you know, they have to follow up everywhere. Um, so, you know, there are about, uh, the last number I knew, there was about a thousand vacant buildings in the city. Um, so, unfortunately they probably did go to the you know they, they were probably directed i should say i don't know if they went but directed to go to those at least once to follow up um because they are included in the larger list that we gave the census bureau about a year and a half ago uh when we updated all the addresses to add new buildings and to uh remove buildings that had been uh, uh that were no longer that no longer existed don't they also work with institutions like the university and the college and all the yeah. med or whatever to determine what buildings they own? They, well, again, we, the city sends the list of all the properties that exist in the city, all the addresses, all the units, um, street by street. Um, but the Census Bureau also does work with the colleges to get their on-campus housing number. Um, that's part of the group quarter enumeration. Um, but I imagine that there probably is some sort of uh, gap between, you know, getting a number from SUNY or St. Rose, et cetera, um, and, and then going to a building that's owned by an institution that may fall into the scenario that you, that you just described. So um, you, sh you, should, you should know that SUNY um, and, and St. Rose and the other um, group quarters, you know, we, we did hear positive stories or positive uh, feedback of uh, these institutions sending in their group quarter enumeration. So um, there is, there that like those numbers got counted. We, you know, they went to the Census Bureau 
Um, and so they, those folks were counted. And the right. signs? We should probably move on, Carol. I think we got to get to the end of it. Uh, but we, we do have some yard signs, just real quick. We do have some yard signs, so if you'd like some, we can make them available and I'll, I'll uh, share with John just to um, get that information out to everyone. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank we you, everyone. It. Thank you, John. Very much appreciate it. Well, so now we are going to uh, the committee officer and other reports, and we'll we'll start out with Luke Rumsey from the Committee on University and Community. Luke, thanks, John, um, and I want to thank Jordan uh, for providing that really comprehensive update uh, with regards to our response to the COVID outbreak and. Um, you know, answering a few of the other questions that are out there. Um, as far as the Committee on University and Community Relations goes, uh, we had our last meeting in September uh, with the Chief, um, Chief of Police, Eric Hawkins, um, and he spoke to us about staffing numbers, uh, the uptick in violence, as well as the, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the department, and that was a really good meeting. Our next meeting is going to be Thursday, October 8th, um, and if anybody does not have the Zoom link for that and would like to be included in that conversation, please feel free to email me offline and I can certainly send you the Zoom link for, for that uh, upcoming meeting. Um, as far as off-campus student services goes uh, with the University of Albany, um, as you know, many of the programs that we typically do this time of year, meet much and more, our block party, our community dinners, the ice cream truck program, our face painting um, with kids in the area, all of those had to kind of go by the wayside due to the COVID pandemic. Um, but our off-campus ambassadors have been extremely busy as of late. Um, for the last four weeks straight, um, they've been doing door-to-doors, um, specifically in the Pine Hills and Beverwick neighborhoods, um, targeting our off-campus students, but also touching base with neighbors as well. Um, and they've really been pushing um, the off-campus expectations, you know, the university has for our students, maintaining social distance, wearing their masks, uh, proper hand hygiene, et cetera. As Jordan alluded to about three weeks ago, um, our off-campus ambassadors distributed just over 2,000 masks um, to students who live in the Pine Hills area, but also to neighbors, right? So we didn't discriminate. We went house to house and we dropped masks. And I think Carolyn, I think you, you got a few masks from us as well. And in addition to those, those masks, which were the cloth reusable ones, we also passed out information on transmissibility and basically how to stay safe. <clears throat> uh, last weekend, we were in Madison Park um, we had noticed all of our off-campus students about um, the surveillance test kits, um, which we were distributing. We also had our off-campus ambassadors delivering them um, right to the homes of our off-campus students. And as, um, as Jordan had mentioned, um, a little over 300 kits um, were sent out um, last Saturday um, via that mechanism. The more students are picking them up on campus as well. Um, we also hosted a micro cleanup on Saturday. Um, the off-campus ambassadors had um, between 15 and 20 New Albany students come through, um, all of which are wearing masks, um, had to stay socially distanced, et cetera. And uh, they focused on Hudson, Hamilton, Quail, Ontario, Western, Elberon, and State. And um, they picked up the area. Um, we hope to do that again, not this weekend, but the following weekend um, as well. Um, and uh, last but not least, I, I wanted to, um, I don't see any other Albany police officers on the phone, but I did want to recognize the fact that um, they've allowed me uh, once again um, as we've done for the past four to five years, to jump in a car with them on the weekends. And for the past four weekends, um, I've been out Friday and Saturday night um, checking in on the students as they are, uh, you know, hanging out and, and whatever they may be doing. Um, I ride with the police and, and we're keeping a very watchful eye on Hudson and Hamilton and, and those, those streets specifically. <clears throat> the uh, Albany Police Department did also uh, begin a codes walk, um, which John, I think we talked about um, at a different meeting. Um, but we've now walked the Pine Hills community twice um, in the last um, five weeks. We have another walk coming up next week. Um, and the, the goal of those, um, we have the Department of General Services as well as building a regulatory compliance, um, the Albany Police Department and then myself. Um, we walk the streets to see, you know, what violations we can observe directly from, from the sidewalk. Um, those are cited. And then the goal is to continue those walks every two weeks to follow up on the violations which have not been rectified, right? So, uh, you know, we've done these before, you know, John, you've been instrumental in that. 
Um, but typically, you know, we really only find the time to be able to get them done once a semester or, or twice over the summer or something along those lines. APD kind of kicked it up the level and now they're doing it once every two weeks, right? So we're hoping that those increased, the increased visibility of DGS, building and regs, the UAlbany and APD being out there looking for these violations and, and really holding the feet of the, the landlords and the students to the fire, um, essentially, um, will make a significant difference. Um, and I think that that was it for me. The last thing I, I guess I would just throw in there, Jordan mentioned at the very end of his presentation, you know, if, if you see um, students that are engaging in behaviors that are concerning to you, whether it be a party, um, loud noise, um, failure to social distance, whatever it may be, let us know. Um, we wanna know, we wanna hear about it. And I, I commend you, John, and the leadership of the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association for getting it out there because the number of calls on the hotline has certainly ticked up this year in comparison to the last couple. I've also been getting some emails, so I appreciate that. Our off-campus hotline number, for those of you who do not know it, uh, 518. 442-5888. Um, and you can also email me directly if you'd like at lrumsey at albany.edu. Um, and we will take those concerns and we will run with them, right? Whether that means that we'll, we'll um, show up at the house the next day um, and touch base with the tenants, or if we have to uh, message them to, to get them in on a Zoom meeting um, so that those issues or concerns can be addressed. Because we, we do want to know what's going on. And, and we're not always down there in the community. And so, but you are. Um, and if you can help us with that, you know, we very much appreciate it. Any questions, threats, concerns, bribes for me? Carolyn, I hope it's a bribe. Uh, are you going to continue doing surveillance tests and dropping kits in the neighborhood? Yeah, so I mean, right now, um, we're, we're hoping to do another distribution, um, not this Saturday, but next Saturday. Uh, I'm sorry, next Sunday, um, in conjunction with the cleanup. So that worked out really well last time. Um, we had the kits, we had a tent, and I, you know, Jordan actually included a photo of the, of the table um, in Madison Park and as part of his presentation. And so we will plan to do that. The time has not been set, um, but likely it's going to be in the afternoon. Again, we want to cater to our students. And on a Sunday, you know, they're typically not up at eight o'clock in the morning. And so we'll probably see if we can't shoot from one to four or one to five or something along those lines. But that worked out really well. So we plan to do that again. Yes. Thank, thank you, Luke. And uh, an important note, there may be more questions, but in the meantime, I wanted to note for everyone, you know, often you see something uh, where you're not sure it's not really a 911 call, maybe, right? It's not a huge party. There are no fireworks. It's not a fight or anything like that. But when you see something that's, you know, still of concern, that's a great thing to call into the hotline or to email to Luke, because they he will take action, have talks with the students. Uh, I mean, you, if there's doubt, you should always dial 911 and do that first. But if you see something where it's obviously probably not something where a police call is appropriate, but student behavior is not safe, particularly in regard to COVID, please do reach out to uh, the hotline and or Luke. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Any, anyone else asking questions? Looks like we can move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, now, I was hoping to have Sergeant Hansen here. I do see a phone number, 7878. That's not Sergeant Hansen, is it? that's Carolyn. No, that's me trying to hear. Oh, okay. Well then, we don't have Sergeant Hansen or anyone else from any of you with us tonight, but uh, we are very grateful for uh, the action they're doing and sort of taking over the, the codes walks and uh, that, that involvement is very, very helpful. So we'll go to zoning and code enforcement. Leah Goldie. Thank you. So at the moment, there are no pending projects in Pine Hills uh, on the planning board, no applications to the Board of Learning Appeals. And at the moment, there, are, there is nothing on the Historic Resources Commission. Um, as John noted in um, his opening statement, the Neighborhood Association did spend some time over the summer getting involved um, in an issue related to zoning and planning, it was not specific to the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association, um, but we got involved because of the concerns around what it 
the potential that Mr. Hoey's ordinance uh, could have to the um, USDO. Uh, John wrote an excellent letter to the editor. Essentially, um, you know, the planning board had recommended that Mr. Hoey uh, hold off on his ordinance and, and kind of rework it. Um, but he didn't want to do that, so it, you know, it kind of was on a roller coaster ride. Um, in the end, as John noted, uh, things there they have come to, I think, a compromise. Mr. Hoey um, is had several meetings uh, with folks from the planning department, and I think they've reached um, a resolution that will work for everyone. You know, he it was very clear that um, he had the best of intentions with his ordinance. He was concerned about public safety, um, and he made he made that very clear. And I think um, in the end, uh, you know, it hopefully will be positive. So that it's and so that's where things stand um, with that ordinance. And I want to thank John for his letter to the editor um, and the rest of the board for working on that with us. There were also two items over the summer on the historic resources agenda. Um, one was the Women's Club on Madison Avenue. And uh, the Neighborhood Association has for years and years and years supported uh, their request to uh, fix their porch and make it ADA compliant. And uh, it, so we actually, we found out that this was on the agenda like the day before the um, meeting. So we didn't even have time to go to the full board and ask about it, but the committee did discuss that we would support it. So I attended that Historic Resources Commission meeting and spoke in support of it. And it uh, was passed unanimously by the Historic Resources Commission. So that's really great for the Women's Club on Madison Avenue. Also, are kind of around the corner from there, there was a project um, uh, at a home on 105 South Lake uh, for to put up a wooden porch. Uh, it was a kind of complicated uh, situation. Uh, at the August meeting, they wound up tabling it. It was really interesting to me. I don't usually go uh, find myself go find myself going to the Historic Resources Commission um, meetings. Uh, but the commission members are uh, very, very knowledgeable, and um, it was really an interesting process. So they wound up tabling that, and they met, you know, they kind of met with the property owner, and uh, he came up with a new solution. I went to the meeting last night, and uh, they did support his new solution, which makes a lot more sense than his original proposal. And so um, that's why it's no longer on the agenda. It passed last night and um, he will have a, a replaced porch that will work um, for the historic district. And that's my update. Any questions? None for me, Leah. And thank you for the credit, although you know you edited that stuff, right? <laughs> You know that. Uh, we, we generally do things by committee and often it, it works in proving a, very, uh, a better written product. Uh, so I'm going to move to uh, Midtown Pine Hills Improvement Group, the group that is formerly known as FIG. Uh, Carolyn, would you like to present? Thanks, John. Um, that's way too distracting. Uh, so the first thing I want to make clear is that we have changed our name. We are no longer Pine Hills Improvement Group because we focus entirely on Midtown Pine Hills. Uh, Leah came up with the new name, Midtown Pine Hills Committee, um, because we are a committee of the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association. And we wanted to clarify that we are, in mid we are focusing on Midtown Pine Hills, not all Pine Hills. Um, the original fig name was proposed by uh, Tom Gephardt and it worked well for us, but we wanted to make clear, you know, exactly where we're, our focus is. Anyway, our next meeting, we had a meet 
a, a rare meeting in August because we don't have meat munch and more, um, but our next meeting will be um, Monday, September 28th at 6.30 p.m. And that will likely be on Zoom. And um, I will send out an announcement of the meeting and then ask people to let me know if they would like an invite because my email list is really long and uh, it's not usually that big of a meeting. Um, we are working on two main things right now uh, because we don't, can't do any of our community building or some of the other type programming we would be doing. One is an effort to get more trees in Midtown Pine Hills. We have been losing trees at an increasing rate over the last uh, decade or so. Um, along with that would be trying to address the blacktop, which is in yards and uh, maintenance strips in places it's not supposed to be, which causes also runoff problems as well as makes it hard for the trees to, to grow and be healthy. Uh, the other issue that uh, we're, folk, we're trying to get re reconstituted is our trash and litter subcommittee. Um, we had just been getting to the point where we were going to do a, sort of a roving focus group with a couple of blocks of neighbors when everything shut down in the spring. So we sort of have to get started and get reoriented and decide what it is that we want to do. So I'm working on setting up meetings for those in the next week or so. Um, we have not lost track of the fact that uh, there is still work to, that we wanna see done at Madison Park, um, but we haven't really gotten, uh, we're at the point where we got input and we have a document that shows that input, um, but we really need to talk to different city departments about what is and isn't doable before we can do a final plan. And obviously the city is overwhelmed, so we're not even, uh, we're, we're, we're pushing that back a little bit more. And one last thing is we would like to try and find ways to support our, our local businesses. Um, they really took a hit when the students left in March. Um, I have been planning to try and get around, especially to restaurants um, that do food delivery or even takeout to try and get information on that so we can create a document or something on our website that we can share that we can then share with the students. Uh, I have not been able to get to that and I would love it if somebody would like to take that on. So um, I will put my earbuds back in now. So if there are any questions. Uh, not seeing any. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. So uh, we'll move on to the Upper Madison group, Virginia. Okay. Um, I don't want to go over the things that we continuously go over. Um, I just want to report some updated information. Um, one thing that we are planning on doing with Awusu's help is to um, set up a um, visit with the price chopper as well as people from the planning board and possibly Bill Trudeau to talk about um, creating a safer access to the store from Madison Avenue and West Lawrence because right now you just pretty much have to walk through the parking lots. So in our original plan that we had commissioned quite a while ago, there was a, um, a diagram showing how this could be done uh, using paints or stripes in the parking lot. So um, we wanna revisit that because it wasn't really completed and then um, possibly see if there might be some other things that could be done to um, kind of slow the traffic down in terms of, you know, making people aware that there are people who access from the streets and they need to have a safe way to get into the store. So that's on the agenda. I don't think we have a date for that yet, but that's coming up. And the second thing is, is um, a walk with um, Albany Parking Authority and planners to, ask, to look at the um, benches that are in front of the price chopper and also um, in that little Tresco kind of park next to St. Peter's to see if we can, if the Albany Parking Authority, when it gets additional funds, can replace those benches with those 
types of benches that are more suitable for an urban kind of environment. So that's gonna happen sometime in, I believe the second week in August. Um, and then we have our usual, you know, streetscape, planters, et cetera. We're not, we don't have a lot of money this year because of the Upper Madison Street Fair. So we'll be reaching out to other possible sponsors such as Price Chopper and maybe some of the other larger businesses in the area. And I think our next meeting is, Marilyn can confirm, I think it's uh, Tuesday, October 8th at three o'clock at the Madison Theater. Thanks, Virginia. Any questions? Not seeing any. Okay, so uh, we'll move on to Treasurer, John. Or excuse me, Eric. Eric, treasurer, anything to report? I was, okay, yeah, I had to unmute myself. Um, there's uh, roughly is a fifty one hundred fifty one hundred dollars in the checking account. There's roughly thirty in the the PayPal, and um, of the fifty one hundred eight hundred thirty seven is uh, belongs to the Madison Park project. Um, we really haven't. We had a few expenses that we're we're gonna pay. I know for like paying for the Zoom and things like that. And there was a few that came through from some other Upper Madison um, receipts from a while ago. So but that's about it. Um, Thank you. Haven't like like everything. It's impacted what we usually sponsor and and that kind of stuff this year. So we haven't been spending any money uh, for that. So the standard things. So that's that's. That's all I've got. Thank you, Eric. John, any any news on membership you'd like to share? Uh, 162 members. Okay. You know we you know we talked about getting some members without paying a fee, and I think we might have got two at the very beginning. We had had none. No one has else has taken up that office, which Probably I think more is kind of that, weird. But I don't have a. Yeah, it's. It's one of the problems is, is we're not sure how far our reach goes when we're reaching out to people, right? But it right. was on Facebook several times. And I know uh, we've had at least one from a FIG meeting. Well, a Midtown Pine Hills meeting. Yeah, I've got probably, probably four altogether. Well, we just doubled it. That's great news. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm guessing now because I'm not keeping track of who's, you know, they will find out, but... Um, I think there, I, one was a couple and one might have been an individual. I don't know. It varies depending on what I look at and what the weather is. It's one or three or four or two. So, but it's not 20. Is that a, a two week rolling average or is that a set period between the 12th and the 20th? That's, that's the one year rolling average after pool testing. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, look, we'd love for more people to join. And once we get this out on YouTube, um, hopefully we'll, we'll have some impact there. Uh, but we are doing our best trying to keep people involved uh, during this very difficult year. So we do have several elected officials here. I saw Alfredo, Joe Igo, and uh, Judy Deshaies. I guess I'll just pick someone to go first. And a reminder to everyone, we, we do ask for five minute limit, but Judy, I'll start with you if you can unmute. In, uh, Joe has been here the whole time, I assume. I just popped in after my other meeting. I'd really like to defer to him first, if you don't mind. Well, okay, but then you might have to wait till after Alfred. Age goes minutes. before beauty, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, John. Uh, as usual, okay, I'm here to support the rest of the councilmen, and I believe Awusu probably represents most of the district. Right, he's not uh, on though, I don't believe. No, that's that's rare, but maybe he's doing a resolution someplace. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, listening to the, the whole meeting tonight, it really focuses on Midtown. Midtown, Midtown, Midtown. Everything from the the APD, uh, buildings and codes, 
and I know what is needed there. Uh, and I know, and I'm not sure if everybody knows this right now, DGS is down 48 workers and the police department's down 60. So I do represent a few neighborhood associations, Eagle Point, Buckingham, uh, not uh, Helderberg, what's that, Judy? Uh, I forget her name. Yeah, no. I'm, re I'm reading your lips, but no. So I'm just here really to help wherever I can, okay? I have, I'm focusing on right now, and I have been for two years, and they're telling me it's coming to uh, fruition in maybe the next month or so. The Upper New Scotland Avenue coming. It's nothing great like Madison Avenue, what was accomplished down there. We're waiting for, for some stripings. Uh, St. Peter's donated, I think it was $100,000. And hopefully we're gonna put out, put out an RFP within the next month to complete that project. Uh, that's, that's basically where I stand right now. I'm very concerned about the, the police, the break-ins up, uh, up in the Eagle Point area. And uh, the part of the Pine Hills that I do represent, I think it's in pretty good shape, okay? Uh, we did some roads there last year over Reichman that way, um, which connects Judy to Woodlawn over there and everything. So trying to stay up on top of it. Uh, David's been very good. The mayor's office has been pretty good. So anybody that I can help, call me, okay? But I really don't want to meddle into somebody else's ward. If I'm asked to, I will. So that's it. That's all I got. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming, Joan. Thank you yeah. for reminding us all about the, good uh, good the meaning, staffing basically. issues. Uh, all the departments we rely on all have staffing issues. And uh, uh, good thing to note. Uh, just for fun, I'm going to go for out to Alfredo now. Alfredo now, and Judy will have to wait. <laughs> If it's a convenient time, Alfredo. I'll let Judy go just because we, we we both at the last, so we both had a planning committee meeting uh, before here. So that's why we both jumped in a little late. I'll let her go because uh, I think she's got a better attendance record than I do at these meetings also. So out of respect to my colleague. Thank well, you. I, I suppose we'll, we'll accept that correction then, but um, <laughs> I hope when we get back to you, everything is, you, you still be- Have you ever seen so much diplomacy amongst elected officials? Um, so a couple of things is I, uh, we are watching uh, the budget and the impact of uh, COVID uh, and the cuts to the uh, state budget, our sales tax revenues going down. Um, we, uh, we are looking at a $17 million uh, loss in this year's uh, budget, uh, and that's part of the reason why there was a hiring freeze. There has been um, a hiring freeze. Um, DGS and the um, D DGS uh, has been given approval to um, uh, post a, a variety of positions because um, they're there's just been such um, a, a deficit in terms of their ability to perform uh, services and they've really been overwhelmed and I'm thrilled that the city is doing that. Um, I also think that as a result of the freeze uh, that has been in effect and their cautiousness that they really have um, predominantly met their goals in terms of uh, reducing um, the number of salary, the, the amount of salaries. They were looking for about uh, $3.5 million in savings in salaries uh, this year as a result of COVID. And uh, in my tracking, um, the uh, expenditure reports and income reports, um, I do think that uh, they are pretty close to have uh, having met that. Um, I'm thrilled um, and I, with DGS doing some hiring of some seasonal workers, et cetera, I have noticed a real uptick in terms of um, work being done um, around the city. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the DGS workers are all, all over the place. Um, the budget is supposed to come out on October 1st uh, for the 20. 
21 and certainly the entire COVID situation um, makes that um, a very difficult challenge for the administration to propose something and have some level of confidence that it is going to be a balanced uh, budget. I expect them to be uh, on the conservative um, side with that, but uh, we will see. The Finance Committee um, has um, uh, scheduled uh, at least 10 or 15 meetings over the next uh, two months uh, to be talking about um, all of those uh, kinds of issues um, uh, and meeting with various department heads. Um, so we generally schedule that a little bit in advance. Um, Michelle will be posting uh, those meetings um, as she does on Facebook and other places. And if you're, you know, a, I, um, I assume she sends it out to the, um, the uh, neighborhood associations. In preparation for the budget, the mayor has offered one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with uh, council members to talk about their priorities, which was kind of interesting in my situation because I went in to talk about my priorities. I provided a PowerPoint presentation, two PowerPoint presentations uh, in advance in, of this uh, half hour meeting. And essentially, as soon as we met, the mayor said, I've, well, I've looked at it and we don't have any money, we don't have any staff. Um, but I persisted uh, because like what a shock, right? That I would persist in talking about what are our priorities in the ninth ward. And one of the things that I noted to you, John, is that um, my highest priority is addressing the actual, absolute um, lack of maintenance in Woodlawn Park for over um, or approximately a third of it. Um, and, um, and in general, not great maintenance on the other part. Um, and also, uh, an issue that I've had is we have a lot of tripping hazards. Um, and so we put in ADA ramps to the new equipment that is ADA compliant. Um, and, and, but people who are disabled really cannot get to it easily. Uh, grandparents have commented. I, I, I met with the deputy director, Justin Atlas, um, down there uh, two and a half weeks ago to talk about ADA access, and it was like there was somebody from the 10th Ward, Pine Hills, there uh, swinging their grandchild, and they were like, are you gonna do anything about the lack of access and the you know litter here? So it was kind of like, you know, I almost put up a shield, you know, to, to uh, raise these issues. Um, so uh, as, re as a result of the attention um, that I've brought to this, been bringing to this issue and making it clear that it's a priority and it's not a huge amount of money necessarily until we get to the fact that the fences have vines that are you know, three feet around growing through it. And, and that's, um, uh, you know, you, how, do you how do you maintain the fences and keep the vines in control if you have these trunks there. I mean, and we're talking about throughout, you know, the, the entire stretch of the area against the National Little League. Part of, I want to, I just want to make sure that people understand part of the reason why I'm talking to this group about Woodland Park is it falls within uh, Pine Hills Neighborhood Association boundaries. Um, and, um, and as a result of the mayor essentially saying to me, Judy, we need people to step up. I and Zach Simpson um, organized a, a, a neighborhood pop-up cleanup and we had over 15 people show up on less than 24 hours notice. Um, so uh, I also wanna note that this particular park, one of the things, if you look at the uh, comprehensive plan it talks about um, where there are areas where there are no parks and people having to walk more than a quarter mile to a park or a half mile to a park. There are parts of my ward and parts of the eighth ward in which there is no park within even a half mile, no park. Um, and for a lot of people in the eighth ward uh, and the 14th ward, this is the closest park that has a playground equipment 
uh, in it. Uh, it services a lot of people um, in any given day. You will see a great diversity of immigrants, people of color, upper middle class white people, um, you know, taking advantage of the park. It is a well loved and well utilized park, um, but the frustration has been we've had 10 foot high weeds growing into trees um, that, that I got them to do a lot of clearing out when we put in the new equipment. That has all grown back and worse because we had some trees that fell down. The trees weren't removed, took over a year to remove the trees. A, tree, a fallen down tree in the park, in a park that is three tenths of an acre, three actually uh, not quite four tenths of an acre. So it's a small park and having a tree fall down, having branches down, and then once they finally remove that, having the, the stumps um, uh, block the actual ability to, um, for uh, like a mower to get around and actually keep the weeds at bay, et cetera. Yeah, As they I have, have to remind you of the time constraint. Okay, so I just want to say that they have gone in there with uh, stump clearers now, and as they did, and as they've cleared out things, they've discovered about 15 stumps in amongst the area that should be usable park space. Um, and, um, and I'm thrilled the amount of work that is going on uh, there at this particular point in time. I've offered to pay for topsoil and seed so that once they clear it, we don't get weeds back, but we can grow grass and, um, and then it can be easily maintained by the DGS crews. Uh, they haven't finished what they're doing there, and that is a topic that is on the table. And I am also looking to create a Friends of Woodland Park organization, which I mentioned to you, and you have passed on to your board. I don't know if that could be done under the umbrella of the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association. My goal would be to have separate fundraising um, and, you know, one of the challenges is so much of the park, uh, people who would be interested in this don't fall in the catchment area of the Pine Hills Neighborhood Association. So, um, you know, I don't know how that would actually work, which is why um, I, I reached out to Ann Savage about how the Buckingham Pond uh, Park Conservancy has been um, uh, set up um, so that I could look at that and why I've reached out to you because I'm looking to do something quick and easy because I think the interest is there, having gotten 15 people on less than 24 hours notice. Um, and I think that um, we are on the brink of actually finally doing this park justice in terms of creating space and having people who are willing to assist DGS in some of the fine tuning maintenance, weed whacking, et cetera. So, thanks, Judy. Uh, we will be getting back to you on that too. But right. uh, so we've raised it, shared your PowerPoint around. Thank you uh, again. And Alfredo, if I could go to you. Did Christine have a question for me? You need to unmute. Okay, thanks. Thank you for uh, reminding me of that. Uh, first of all, Judy, I, I love your uh, emails. I, I watch them. I've listened to them. I'm in the 10th ward. I know you're not, but I, I watch, I, I read your emails like crazy. So I appreciate it. Um, knowing that there's a few officials on this call, um, not mine from the 10th ward tonight. Um, I have a question about um, that. I'm hoping you can answer me from an elective official. If you are doing, if you are reporting someone on a, and again, I appreciate everything you've done with the parks, I, and I love watching your updates, but if you are doing a, a, a C-click fix repeatedly um, for a neighbor um, in your neighborhood, I, I'm wondering, and this is a question I put out to, to a Swanee, I call him chief. Uh, he hasn't gotten back to me, I'm, I'm hoping he will. If I put out a um, C-click fix, and a couple of weeks go by on a lawn that hasn't been mowed and then it gets mowed um, and then it doesn't get mowed and then I put it out again and it gets mowed and it doesn't get mowed and then it gets mowed and then I put it out again over the course of my entire summer. Um, what, what is the um, consequence to the owner? To the, so all I'm trying to find out is 
at what point do they get fined? If I, if they get the summons and they fix it, does it reset the clock or do they get a fine? Because this is an absentee landlord clearly um, situation. And so I'm thinking I keep doing this and then eventually it's so high someone comes in, but it's not the city. So they've clearly gotten a summons and they've done it. Is, what's the penalty to the landlord? And I'm hoping an elected official can tell me that because I, I'm trying to figure it out. So my guess is if, if the landlord is taking care of it before the city needs to come in and take well, care no, of it? No, not before the city needs to come in. The city never comes in. I have, to, I have to take a photo. I have to send it. It takes a week, a, so, a week or so for them to get their summons. They hire someone because I've talked to the people they've hired. They're not the city. I go, oh, your first time here? So they hire fly-by-nights to do it. They leave. Then I have to wait for the lawn to get this. When do they get a fine is what I'm trying to find out as a, a city owner. So my guess is, that, and, and unless it is the city that is winding up having to come in and do the work, if they've been provided with their notice and they do the work within the five days that they're required no. to do the work, then I, think, then I okay. think that they are not being fined. Okay, that, 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 that was, the, you answered my question. Um, then I would like to propose that there's a way for this city to make more money and it needs it because multiple summons, multiple C-click fixes going in do not, what, this is five and six of them. So they get their summons. What, uh, why does it have to be that the city has to come in before they, you could make money. There's an opportunity for the city to make money here. It, and where, and with the city, I, you know, I'm not going to go into that right now, but do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I, I, I hear you. I'm making a note of it. I'm going to double check with you. BGS with thank regard you. to whether what my belief is, but based upon something that we did recently with regard to legislation, um, I think that they generally do not find people unless they have to go in and do the work and then they charge them for the work and then they also do the fine. But Never have. Snow removal or snow removal all winter or whatever. They, I don't believe they've ever been, that their taxes have ever been going up, but okay. It's an opportunity though. I see it as an opportunity. Hi yeah. Leah. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> We're kind of running out of, of time, but this is a, a very key issue and it's something we want to look at more because we find that the same properties over and over again and in Midtown case, nine times they do get fined, but even getting fined multiple times does not drive a change in behavior. So I think we really need to find, and by the we, I mean the city, other neighborhoods, all of us, to focus in on these problem properties and somehow get them to change their behavior. But probably that won't be able to be taken care of by the time in the time remaining tonight. No. Uh, so uh, Alfredo, you've been patient. Uh, was there you'd like to share with our group? I'll be very brief. Um, I want to thank everyone who came out to the neighborhood series that we did this summer. We were able to hit every neighborhood that I represent in the 11th Ward, uh, which includes uh, the area of Pine Hills, uh, the area of the West End, the Beverwick, and the Washington Square neighborhoods. Uh, like Judy said, it's always great to see people coming out doing their part try to keep our neighborhood uh, neighborhoods and parks clean uh, and to do whatever we can. Um, we are in a fiscal difficulty uh, but if uh, you know if I've been told that sometimes people are having a hard time getting the recycling bins from the city if that's the case uh, let me know send me an email with your address um, and uh, I can let DGS know and they'll either drop it off or they'll allow me to pick it up and drop it off. Um, so really, I, I, I think I, Judy said a good chunk of what we have going on, so I'm not, I don't need to repeat it. Uh, it's gonna be a difficult budget year. It's gonna be uh, a difficult, difficult next 12 months, uh, but I'm hoping after, uh, hoping after we have a vaccine and then settle down, uh, we'll be in a better place. 
that's that's all I have. And I'll take any questions if anyone has any. I'm not seeing any, uh, Alfredo, but thank you very much. Uh, that's, uh, that's a nice thought to end on. And uh, I want to thank everyone for participating tonight. Uh, it, it appears that Facebook uh, Facebook Live didn't work. Again, we had troubles with it last time, so we really need to find an alternative, which will probably be YouTube. So we will do that next time. Uh, with that, I think we're going to adjourn. So uh, thank you, everyone, and good night. Marilyn was saying something. Oh, I thought. It'll have to wait till next meeting. <laughs> no, I, no, I just wanted to say, Judy was talking about Woodlawn Park, but if any of you have a chance, go over on Woodlawn Avenue. They have a, there is now a sidewalk and DGS did a beautiful job. And I said that it should be the Owusu and Judy way because it's really, it's really great that finally there's a sidewalk and anybody who goes from Pine Hills over to New Scotland, you can walk on the sidewalk. So we do have a plus. Awesome. I do, I do want to say that, um, Linda Stancliffe, who um, designed um, the um, New Scotland Commercial District and dealt with a lot of challenges. She's great at listening. Uh, we got together the residents um, and I conveyed uh, their concerns. Um, and she's great at incorporating uh, things into it. And, um, and, and I think, it has turned a drag strip for which there have been many, many accidents into a much more uh, typical residential uh, neighborhood um, street. And I am thrilled. I'm thrilled with what they did uh, with that. And it was great working with them on that project. Fantastic. Thank you, Judy, Marilyn. I'm gonna try once again. Good night, everyone. We will see you in a month. And thank you very much.